who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and who has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Yes. This is the generation of those who seek him. Your face we will seek. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Yes. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Would you pray with me? Father, we are here to seek your face. Father, all of us walked in this door, and the truth be told, all of us, whether we've consciously have thought of it or not, came here seeking something. Father, I pray right now that you'd cause us in the quietness of the moment to turn our thoughts to Jesus. That, Father, we would be like the Greeks in John chapter 13 that come to the disciples and they said, we would see Jesus. Father, cause us right now to turn our hearts to seek the face of Jesus. He is what we need. Regardless of what we came seeking today, would you turn our hearts right now to seek the Lord Jesus? And may he be lifted up. And may he, as he's lifted up, transform his people. And may he, as he's lifted up, draw those who do not know him to salvation. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, I just want to get something out of the way really quick before I forget it. Getting Baptists to change and accept something new is kind of like herding cats. You ever try to hear, they just go everywhere. Can't herd cats. So we've made it worse this morning by confusing you. If you look in your bulletin, the bulletin's right. The new service time starting the first Sunday of October is 10.15, not 10.30. Now I know a lot of you are going to treat it as 10.30 anyway because you're going to be 15 minutes late. But if you want to be on time, it starts at 10, 15. What time does the new service start first Sunday of October? Y'all doing great. You're not cats, you're dogs today. All right. All right. I want to take just a moment to welcome our guests. Uh, I know that we have some guests. Hey, uh, uh, we have some uh, family come home today. Where are you at, Dink and Tracy? I don't want to embarrass you. Where, where y'all at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Hey, everybody say hello to Dink and Tracy. Isn't it good to see them? Amen. But we also have some first time guests or it may be your second, third time. And if you're here today and you're a guest, we would really appreciate it. If you would look on the right hand side of the worship bulletin and there's a tab that provides a place for uh, you to fill out some information about yourself. And uh, if you would do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by, we would consider that your gift to us. And right now these guys down front that are smiling and looking so good and this young uh, man up in the balcony have a gift package in their hands. We'd like to give, give you a gift. So if you're here today and you're a guest, would you just right now slip your hand up in the air and let us get this in your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. Just put it up in the air. Back there on the left, Ed, on the right. Dale, back on the back on the right. All right. Up in the balcony. Don't want to miss anybody. Keep your hands up. We got short attention spans here. All right. Hey, thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for being here today. And we are excited about the worship service. We expect to see great things from the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Let's come into this worship service expectant and the Lord will give us according to our desires. Let's all stand together.
Father, we're truly grateful that we can come in to your house this morning, Lord, and just worship you in truth, Lord. Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, and you say, your word says, if you be lifted up, you will draw all men towards you, Lord. Father, I just pray for those that are going to be saved this morning here or somewhere else, God, just thank you for that. Father, I thank you for Alan, Lord, as he leads us in worship and praise and 
God, as Brother Randy just brings the message that you've given him, Lord, just anoint him, Lord, with your power from on high. And God, as we take up this offering, we just ask you, bless it. May it be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
Psalms 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It met, it's my meditation all the day. The commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are, all, they are ever mine. Have more insight than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are thy meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I observe thy precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep thy word. I have not turned aside from thy ordinances, for thou, for thou thyself hast taught me. How sweet are thy words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. If you're able, will you kneel with me as we pray? As I think of the the words of scripture and then the words of this song Lord ancient words words Lord that have been true from the beginning they're true today and they'll be true forever Lord not one of your words will be erased not even the smallest stroke Lord your ways are good your ways are righteous and holy and Lord God, I hope it is the cry of our heart that we love thy word. That is, that we do meditate on this all day, day and night. Lord, that your word directs our life. Lord, one of the biggest parts of worship we have, Lord God, is the preaching of your word. Lord, if your word does not take root in our lives, Lord God, we cannot live the life you call us to live. Jesus said, it's not by bread alone I live, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Lord God, I pray that these ancient words are forever on our hearts, are forever renewing our minds. Lord, that we will be wiser, Lord God, but not for our glory, but for yours. Lord, that we may take these words and proclaim them to a lost and dying world, and you will open the eyes of the lost. Lord, your ancient words would have shown us the path. Lord, the word was with you in the beginning. Lord, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and through all things have been created through him. Lord, the ancient word will live forever. Holy words of our faith handed down to the same.
how blessed we are to have such a wonderful music ministry that takes us into the presence of God. If you haven't already done so, uh, turn to the 13th chapter of Genesis, and then I, I need you to go ahead and find 2 Peter. That's uh, towards the end of the New Testament, chapter, 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read from both this morning. Isn't it amazing? 2 Peter is right before 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation, so 2 Peter is very close to the end of the Word of God. Isn't it amazing how the, all the Word of God ties together from Genesis all the way to Revelation? It is the ancient words of God. While you're finding that in your Bible, let me kind of give you a heads up on what's going to take place the next couple of weeks. I've been working on a three-part sermon series on Lot. I've entitled it A Saved Soul but a lost life. You'll see that this morning on the screen, this morning's part one. I, I really want to encourage you to come back tonight. Tonight's part two. And then next Sunday will be part three. And then two weeks from today, Sunday morning, we're going to have a very special service in the life of our church family. We're going to ordain Brother Brian Cameron into the gospel ministry. Amen? Amen. Isn't that great? So I really want to encourage you not to miss a single one of these three sermons. I've been working on it while our guest speakers have been in, and I'm really excited about preaching it. So if nobody else gets a blessing, I, I'm planning on getting one. But I, I believe it is a very important word from the Word of God. Would you stand with me as we uh, read first from Genesis chapter 13? We read the Word of God. We're going to read beginning in verse 5 down through verse 12. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So Abraham said, Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right, and if to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other, and Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Would you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2? We're going to read verse 6 through 8. 2 Peter 2, verse 6 through 8. The ancient words of the Lord say, And if he, he being God, condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Would you pray with me? Father, I am so thankful for the song that we just sang, that we just knelt and prayed as we sang it. Ancient words ever true changing me, changing you. Father, we have commanded in your word, when we are born again, when we become your children, you tell us that we need a transformation of our minds, that we must transform our minds and not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And that's the choice that each of us face today. We will either begin to think the way that you think by being in your word and transforming our mind or we will think the way the world thinks 
and we will let the world conform us, even as the children of God, into what it would have us to be. So, Father, as we look the next three worship services at the tragedy of Lot, a righteous man, I pray that it would come as a great warning to us as believers in Jesus today. Father, I pray, O oh, ancient words, ever true, change us today. And would you begin with me? In the lovely name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There is a saying, keep your enemies, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies even closer. Now, I do agree that it is very important that we all understand as believers today that we have real enemies in this world. We have at least three enemies. The Bible tells us that we have the enemy called the world, the flesh would be our second enemy, and the devil would be a third enemy. And I'm going to talk to you today about the world, one of our at least three enemies. Because I'm here to tell you that no believer in Christ can afford to be ignorant about any of these enemies. And I think today in the church in America today, we are far too ignorant about our enemy that the Bible, the Word of God, calls the world. Keep your friends close, I mean close, but your enemies even closer. I believe today that a whole lot of Christians believe that saying applies to them spiritually because an awful lot of Christians today keep the world far too close to their bosom. Far too many Christians today have a flirtation, a relationship going on with the world that in the end is going to cost them their very life. You'll notice I've entitled this sermon series about Lot, a saved soul but a lost life. Did you know that the world, that the Bible, the Word of God refers to the world as a harlot? That it refers to the world as a prostitute. Listen to James chapter 4 verse 4. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know? Now I want to stop right there. I want you to understand something. James states it in the negative, but right here the Word of God saying there is something as a child of God that you need to know. Do you see that? You need to know something, James is saying. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You only have two choices today. Do you know that? You can be a friend of the world or you can be a friend of God. You can't have both. If you're here today and you're a believer, you can't, you can't have both. You'll either set yourself up in a hostile situation with God or you will reject the world. You see, our problem is today that we treat the world as if it's neutral ground. That's the way we approach the world. And that is because, I believe, of our biblical ignorance. The world is everything but neutral. The world, there couldn't be a further truth more opposite from the Word of God than to say that the world's neutral ground. The, Bible, the biblical truth is, is that the world is an enemy to God and it's an enemy to God's people. Today, we're going to start our first message. And today I'm going to talk to you about the world because we need to understand what is it about the world that makes it such a formidable foe. I believe it's because the world appears to be so friendly, doesn't it? It, it, it comes across as a friendly enemy, if you will. It, it becomes across as it's, uh, it wants you to believe it's neutral. It wants you to, to believe that it's benign, that, that it's friendly, that it's harmless, that it's innocuous. But you'd better be aware, aware because the Word of God says the world is the enemy of the people of God. Do you understand that? It's your enemy. So if we're going to talk about our enemy today, we'd better first define our enemy. You might be saying, well, well, what do you mean, preacher, when you talk about the world? We'll put the world in quotation marks, the world. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, obviously it comes from the Greek word cosmos. In the, in the beginning, God created the cosmos. 
So I want you to understand, first of all, when, when the Bible's warning us about the world, it's not talking about the earth. It's not talking about planet earth. There, there's absolutely nothing evil, nothing wrong with, with the rocks and the trees and the sea and the sky and the things that God created. In fact, God loves his creation. Did you know that? He loves it so much that one day he's going to put it back and make it right again. He's not giving up on the planet Earth. So when the Bible talks about the world, we're not talking, we're not warning you about the planet Earth. Secondly, we're not warning you, the Bible's not warning you about the people of the world. Let's think for a minute about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. The Bible in John 3, 16 is talking about the fact that God loves the people of the world. He loves all the people of the world. So it's not warning us about the people of the world. So what does the Bible mean when it says the world? For example, what does John mean in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 when John gives this warning? Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, you'd agree that's a stern warning from the Word of God. Amen? What does the Bible mean when it says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world? Well, the Bible's warning you about a system, about an organized order of things. You know, we use the terms all the time, don't we? The world of, of business, the world of finance, the world of sports. A lot of us participated in the world of sports yesterday as we watched uh, uh, college football. So we use that phraseology all the time. What do we mean when we say the world of finance? Well, we're talking about an organized system, aren't we? Something that is a system of thought that's organized for a purpose. So the Bible warns us, don't love the world. Don't love the system of the word. World, the word of God calls the world. It's talking about a world of wickedness. It's talking about a world that's in rebellion against God. And we're commanded, brothers and sisters, not to love it. Let's just look at John, 1 John chapter 2, 15 once again. Love not the world, nor the things of the world. Now, now stop right there. We're, we're told not to love the world. We're not to love this organized system of wickedness and thought that's everywhere in the world. But I want you to notice the second part of that warning. Here's where we let our guard down. So I'll love not the things of the world. You see, the world has things that it uses to draw the people of God away. So, I want to use the Word of God today, and I want to try to paint you a portrait of the world. Well, let's just take a canvas and the Word of God and, and do some brush strokes from the Word of God, and, and let's walk away here today understanding clearly who our enemy the world is because I tell you the world is what destroyed Lot. We're going to understand the world and then tonight we're going to come back if you'll come and we're going to talk and show you from Genesis how the world lured Lot away. How it enticed him. It courted him. It flirted with him. It sucked him in. And then next Sunday morning if you'll be here I'll tell you what the world cost Lot. What it cost him to love the world and the things of the world. I want you to see first of all today that the world has a prince. Did you know that? That this organized system called the world has a prince? This ungodly system has a ruler. It has a, a general, if you will, that's guiding it, that's, that's strategizing its organized system. And that ruler has a name and his name is the devil. Listen to what the Bible says about that more. The Lord Jesus himself, what he said about that in the Gospel of John in chapter 12, verse 31. For example, here's what Jesus said. He said, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. 
You see, Jesus said that Satan rules this ungodly system called the world. Again, John chapter 14, verse 30, listen to what Jesus said. He said to his disciples, I will not speak with you much more. For the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. That he's coming, the organizer of this system's coming for Jesus, but they have no hold on him because he's sinless. He has nothing in me. And Jesus again calls the devil the ruler of the world. Do you remember when Jesus was drawn out into the wilderness in the temptations? And one of the temptations was that Jesus took Jesus, uh, I mean, the devil took Jesus on a high place and in a moment, in, in, a, in a blink of the eye, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and offered to give them to Jesus. Did you never note that the, Jesus didn't call him a liar, that, that Satan had the authority to give Jesus the world, if he would but fall down and worship him. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world will be judged. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how much more clear to, to make it. The world has a ruler, and the ruler of the world is Satan. The whole world According to John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world lies in the bosom of the evil one. John says in 1 John 5, 19, he says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, Satan's got the whole world in his hand. The whole world lies in his sway under his, his influence. Do you ever wonder, people say all the time, I don't know what's wrong with the world. Well, maybe today you will. You see, when you become, and you start thinking through a biblical worldview, when you begin to be transformed in your mind like Romans 12, verse 2 tells us we ought to be, you can read the news and it will make a whole lot more sense to you. You ever wonder why Christianity, why the name of Jesus is the only name that's so hated in the world? You ever wonder why you bring up Jesus and they'll want to lynch you, but you can bring up Muhammad or Islam and that's no problem? It's because the world's been under the influence of the evil one and he hates Jesus, amen? amen. That's his arch enemy. Jesus is of God. He doesn't have, Satan's not threatened by Muhammad. Muhammad's not from God, but Jesus is. Well, I want you to notice secondly, not only does the world have a prince, but the world's also you better get this down. It's got a philosophy. It's got a way of thinking. It's got a philosophy. The world has an enticing network of ideas and values that the devil is skillfully weaving together in order to attract you as a child of God. Did you know that? The world is calling out to you every day a siren song. And that song was written by the prince of the world. You better let it soak in. He's weaving together an enticing set of ideas and values that's calling out to you as a child of God in order to try to attract you as a child of God. You remember the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Who all seen that movie? You mean these people here not seen that movie? Man, that's good stuff, written by a great writer. But in the movie, if you've seen it, when, when Edward goes through the wardrobe and ends up in Narnia, and it's all snow-covered and winter and all that, it appears to be neutral ground. You kind of sense there's something wrong, but it doesn't jump out at you that something's wrong. And then that beautiful white witch comes riding up and and she takes Edward into her carriage, and, and she's so friendly. She's so inviting. She's so enticing that Edward just gets sucked right in. And then she gives him, I forget what the food was. We'll be Baptists. We'll just say it was fried chicken, although it wasn't. <laughs> but she gets him hooked on what she has to offer him. That is a good image of what the philosophy of this world is wanting to do to the children of God. It wants you to believe that it's neutral. It wants you to believe it's your friend. And it has got a philosophy that it will get you hooked on and will suck you right in. Listen to what Jesus said in John 
I'm sorry, listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. The, the world had crept into the Corinthian church. Paul's trying to make the Corinthian church aware of the enemy in its midst. Listen to what, what he, Paul had to say to warn them about its philosophy in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. He said, now we have received, talking about the children of God, the spirit of the world. We have not received the spirit of the world, I'm sorry, but the spirit that is from God. Paul said, we not received the spirit of the world. There's two different spirits out there. Paul talks about the spirit of the world, that there is an influence, like the Holy Spirit's supposed to influence us. There is an influence, a spirit of the world that will influence you if you're not careful. But secondly, he says to the church at Corinth in chapter 3, verse 19, he says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. Paul says that this world's got its own wisdom, Amen. It's got its own way of thinking, and it's contrary to the wisdom of God. It's got its own ideas, its own philosophies. And then Paul says finally in Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, when he's talking about the, the passions of this world, he's talking to believers about don't get sucked up in, in the passions of things that are temporary. He says in verse 31, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. He's saying don't use the things of this world to fuel your passions. That it's all passing away. So friend, it doesn't matter whether it's from the schoolhouse or the courthouse. It doesn't matter whether it's from Wall Street or whether it's Madison Avenue. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. There is an enemy out there that's wanting to pull you away and it has its own philosophy that's permeating everything we see. And we live in a sad, sad situation in the church today. Because we have become, especially in America, so biblically ignorant that we don't even know. We don't even recognize the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And if you're here today and you're a believer, you'd better wake up because you're going to end up like so many people that I have held their hands as they were breathing their last save souls that had lived a lost life. And they're coming down to the grave filled with regret because they embrace the world's philosophy. Not only a philosophy, but thirdly, as we paint this portrait of the world, it has a purpose. It has a purpose. Again, we, we act as though the world, we approach the world as though it were neutral. Well, you don't understand, preacher. I can go to the casino. I'm going to meddle now. I can go to the casino. And I can go to the, the shows. And I can go eat in the restaurants. And I can do this and I can do that. And it won't hurt a thing. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. I pick casinos. I could have picked something else. But being living in Gulfport, I think that's a pretty good example. The world has a purpose. It is not neutral. We better understand that. Nothing could be further from the truth. The devil wants you to believe that. He wants you to believe that philosophy. He wants you to believe that the world's neutral. Because he wants you to believe that because he's got a purpose. And you want to know what its purpose is for the child of God? It's to draw your love away from the Savior. It's to draw your love away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time you go a little further in the world, as we will see later with Lot, the further you're going from Jesus and the colder your love will be towards Jesus. You ever wonder why in the end times the Bible says the love of many will grow cold? Well, we're living in the end times. All you got to do is look around. It's because the church is in the world so much that the world has drawn its heart away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the world is unalterably opposed to the things of God. It's hostile towards the things of God, not neutral. 
And that's why we live in the world. If you're in the world, that is why the Bible says, if you love the things of the world and the world, you are an enemy. You are hostile to God. It's not this talking about lost people. It's talking about children who's breaking its father's heart. That you're hostile to your father if you're saved. John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Oh, preacher. You preached on having to share the gospel with our co-workers and I went down to, and I, I shared the gospel with a co-worker. Now they don't like me anymore. Well, shock, shock. What part of the world hates me? And if you reflect me, Jesus, it's going to hate you. Don't you understand? The world hates Jesus. I mean, you know, you can go in the military right now, the organized system, the world of the military. You can go into the world of education and you can mention anything you want to, but don't you dare say the name Jesus. You can talk about Muhammad, but not Jesus. Why do you think the world is embracing homosexuality and hates heterosexual one man, one woman, one lifetime marriage so much. It's because the world is hostile towards God. Homosexuality is not from God. Heterosexual one man, one woman, one lifetime is from God and the world hates it. Wake up! Yeah. Smell a coffee! We're in enemy territory. Jesus said, chapter 14 of John, Verse 16, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Now watch this, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor does it know him. Amen. Remember John chapter one, it says, even though he made the world, the world did not know him. Jesus says we have a spirit of truth that the world does not, cannot, never will understand. It never will unperceive it. It never will accept the things of God. And if you're a child of God, the world does not know what you know. Yes. You ever realize that? You ever say like me in a moment, say, why don't they see it? Amen? I mean, I'm not a religious person. I love the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm saved. Heaven's my home, and I'm walking with the Lord, and I have a relationship, and man, I, I, it's as real as that piano right there. I know that I know. But why don't they see it, preacher? Why, they, why do they keep going on? And it's because they cannot know. They cannot receive it. Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 18, listen to what Jesus said. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You ever make sense now that Jesus said, woe to you if the world speaks well of you? Does that not make a little more sense in contrast to that? Notice in that passage, four times Jesus uses the word hate or hates. It either hates Jesus, and if you're like me, it's going to hate you. Why? Because it has got a system, it's got a purpose, and you have abandoned the system. You have abandoned the purpose of the world, and it can't stand it. You're not like it anymore. Any friend of Jesus is going to be an enemy of the world, and any friend of the world is going to be an enemy of Jesus. That's your choice today. That is your choice today. Not three, not four, not five. Two. And that is why we'll go right back to where we started, James chapter 4, verse 4. That is why the Bible says to such a person, You adulteresses. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you're friendly today with this ungodly system, and you know right now, some of you, that you are. Some of you are watching things on your computer you ought not be watching. Some of you are doing things that you know in your heart that's wrong, but you think you know what, it's not hurting nobody. If you're friendly with this ungodly system, the Word of God clearly says you are God's implacable flow. You're His enemy. And let us never underestimate the world's purpose. Its purpose is to draw your love away from the Lord Jesus Christ and to make your life totally ineffective, just like Lot's life, we will see, was. Our last brush of the paint. Our portrait of the world, the world also has a people. It has a people. You know, we are to love the people of the world. I want to make that clear. God loves the people of the world. We are to love the people of the world. But here's where we get confused. Here's where we get a little muddled in our thinking. We are to love the people of the world, but don't kid yourself. The people of the world will never love you if you are like Christ. You're going to find out that every time you become a spiritual Christian, you're going to find out that there's people of the world, worldly people that are not going to love you. In fact, if you get spiritual enough, they're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. John 15 verse 19, Jesus said, if you were of the world... If you were of the world, the world would love you. You get that? If, big word, if. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you're not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You know, if you're born again in Christ today, you need to understand something. If you're truly born again, that what you believe starts at a different source than what the world believes. You need to understand that the course that you're following is a different course than what the world follows. You need to understand that the end of your life is going to have a different conclusion than what's going to happen for people in the world at the end of their life. Everything about you is supposed to be different because you are twice born people. You are twice born and you live in a world of once born people. And brothers and sisters, if you're twice born, if you live for Jesus, you're gonna be going against the tide of the world all your life. You're gonna be swimming upstream against the current of the prince and the philosophy and the purpose and the people of this world. It's never gonna change. You're not going to change Washington. You're not. You know why? Because it's part of the political system of the world, just like Russia and everywhere else. You know how you change the world? By rejecting the world. Then you can begin to change the world by one heart at a time as you look like Jesus and Jesus uses you to draw people to him. But don't, don't get confused. You're twice born. And you might understand people of the world. I understand a lot of where the world's coming from. You know why? Because I used to be once born. I used to be one of them spiritually. But don't kid yourself. They are not ever going to understand what you know unless they get twice born. They're going to hate you. I, I like to put it this way. You want, it, you want to get them to see it so bad, don't you? If you're here today and you're lost and, 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 and you, you, you know that you don't, you're not twice born, I would do anything to get you to see the reality of salvation in Jesus Christ. I'd just love to sit down and reason with you and tell you how he's changed my life and, 
and, and how he'll change your life. And, and life doesn't have to be this way. And you can have peace and joy that surpasses understanding. You can have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. He'll supply all your needs. I want to explain it to you, but you know what the problem is? Explaining how to be twice born to somebody once born it's like trying to explain the color red to somebody born blind. Can you imagine trying to explain to somebody that's never seen a day of their life what red looks like? And that's the problem. When you try to explain Jesus to people that are only once born. So, this proper understanding of the world, this, this friendly enemy, if you will, this innocuous enemy, you see, it sets a platform for what we're going to begin to look at tonight in Lot's life. Because I'm here to tell you that when you look at Lot, Lot is a classic example of far too many Christians today. Some in this very auditorium right now. You've got a saved soul, but so far you're living a lost life. Your life's not counting for Jesus. Now, you, you might be a little bit like me. And you might be tempted to think that Lot was not a saved man. And I'll be honest with you, if it wasn't for Second Peter chapter 2, I'd, I would not believe Lot was a safe man, saved man. But the Word of God is proof, is it not? That Lot was a just man. He was a righteous man. If we look back at Second Peter chapter 2 verse 6 through 8 that we read, the Bible says he, God rescued righteous Lot. That means he was right with God. That he, a lot oppressed, was oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men for by what he saw, he heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day by day. You see, Lot was a saved man. I expect to see Lot in heaven one day. And you should too if you're saved. He was a saved man. But with that, we'd be wise to keep that in mind and let that be a serious warning as we go through this sermon series. That had better be a serious warning to you, brother and sister. Lot was a saved man. And if you don't realize that, you just might begin to think, well, you know what? I'm saved. Since I'm saved, I don't have anything to worry about. You'd be badly wrong. You've got a lot to worry about. I've got a lot to worry about. I want to remind you that you've got a real enemy, a friendly enemy, that same enemy that destroyed Lot's life, that same enemy's calling out to you today. It's courting you today. It's singing a song to you today. Come and embrace me. Come and follow me. That same enemy that vexed the soul of this just man Lot is wanting to vex your soul. It's wanting to destroy your family this world can take a hold of you, brothers and sisters, even if you're saved. It can grab a hold of you, and it can cost you everything because it will pull you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. All because you try to caress it, you try to date it, you try to court it, you don't renew your mind. You're in Christ, but you're in the world. I want to close I like to listen to the 60s channel occasionally on XM, on a serious XM. I was working on this sermon series and going down the road and I said to Brent, I said, that will preach right there. You remember the song called The Snake by Al Wilson, 1963? I wasn't that old, but anyway. It, it, it's a parable. It's a song. It's a fable. He made it popular back in the 60s. And I thought, man, that sums up the average Christian today. I want you to listen to these lyrics as you think about what we've talked about, this enemy of the world. The lyrics go like this. On her way to work one morning, down the path alongside the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Oh, well, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Oh, take me in, oh, gentle woman. Take me in for goodness sake. 
Take me in, old tender woman, sighed the snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a curvature of silk. And then she laid him by the the fireplace with some honey and some milk. Now she hurried home from work that night as soon as she arrived. She found that pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Now she clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, you might have died. Now she stroked his pretty skin and then she kissed him and held him tight. But instead of saying thanks, that snake gave her a vicious bite. I saved you, cried that woman, and you bit me even why? You know your bite is poisonous and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew well I was a snake before you took me in. See, the world's calling to you today, believer. Oh, take me in, oh, gentle believer. Take me in for goodness sake. It's calling to you. Do you not feel it? And you can caress it and put it by your fireplace and take it in your home. And it will cost you your life. And you got no right to complain because you knew it was a snake when you took it in. Alan's going to come and we're going to have a time of response. And I wonder today, who may be here that you really believe that you're saved, but you know there's things in your life God's been dealing you with and you've been putting it by your fireplace, you've been caressing it, you've been stroking it, and you're in the world. Right now would be a time that you give whatever it is that you're holding out, whatever you've not given up in the world, right now would be the time, if you're a believer, for you to do that. But I want to direct my attention to you that are here today, and there's people here that you've never been born again. You're, you're once born like I talked about. The world's got its grasp on you. And the world wants you to believe that you don't need Jesus because it hates Jesus. But I've got good news for you. He's real. And salvation is real and life is best lived, lived for Jesus. And you're not going to understand that until by faith you confess that you're a sinner and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and save you from this enemy, the world. And by faith you accept what Jesus did on the cross and nothing else. And you give him your life and you turn from your sins and you say, Lord, the best I know how, I'll live for you. That's what it takes to be saved. And right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Your heart's beating fast. There's a lump in your throat. You don't know what's different about today. It's because God is calling you to come out of the world and come into Jesus. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. There'll be pastors down front. If you'd come, we'd love to show you how to be saved. We'll take you out back. We won't embarrass you. We'll take you out in private and, and take all the time you need. But whatever God's laying on your heart, be you saved, be you lost, that's what you need to do today. The world's going to be whispering to you while we respond. Don't do it. No need to do it. You need to do whatever the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart. And if you're here and God's been dealing with you about joining the church, this will be a time for you to do that. I want to pray for you. Then we're going to stand and we're going to respond. Father, I just pray for this lovely congregation of people today. And God, as sure as I'm speaking your name, as sure as I'm standing here, God, we've got people of every variety here spiritually. We've got those who've rejected the world and the best they know how are living for you. I thank you for them, Lord. We've got those that have accepted Jesus and are saved and are embracing the world, be it materialism, be it sexual morality, be it whatever it may be. I pray for them, Lord. Would this be the day they'd give it all up and start living a life that's going to count for something in eternity. And Lord, most of all, I pray for those that don't know you Oh, God, 
Would you give them the courage right now, like you did me so many, many years ago, to step out and take Jesus by the hand, by faith, and be gloriously born again. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Would you respond?